Welcome back, everyone. We are beginning our fourth and final session on focus on the scriptures, looking at the Acts of the Apostles. It's really hard to um, believe we're already at the uh, final session here, but it's just been a kind of hydroplane through the 28 chapters of Acts, going through it very, very quickly. But I've wanted you to kind of take away some important points. Um, we began by saying this really is the first history book of the early church, and it chronicles how the church was established in Jerusalem, but then quickly expanded into the Gentile community. It really revolves around two key figures, the pillars of the church, you might say, Peter and Paul. And you remember last uh, session, I showed you the icon of these two beautiful apostles who, in reconciliation, gave each other the peace, the hug, uh, or the kiss of peace, you might say, the beautiful expression of unity in the church. So uh, we're looking today in, at the final chapters, chapters 16 through 28, where we're lo really looking at the second and third missionary journey of Paul, and then finally his trial in Rome. Some call it his fourth missionary journey when he arrives in Rome at the end of his life. Um, I would like to just do a real brief review from last week when we looked at this together, we looked at Acts chapter 13 through 15. We really looked at how after um, the uh, disciples had prayed and fasted and laid their hands on Paul, they sent him to be a missionary to the Gentiles. And so he makes his first missionary journey proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, first to the synagogues and then to the streets, first to the Jews, and then to the Gentiles. And he really comes to see himself as the one who's been given the mission to bring this good news to the Gentile community. Uh, it's really, really an uh, exciting, beautiful portrayal of that. We also uh, uh, ended the, our session by looking at Acts 15 and the First Council of Jerusalem, where it was decided that uh, the new Gentile converts or believers in Jesus as the Messiah who became Christian would not be required to keep the kosher laws nor the sign of the covenant which had been circumcision, but that they should enter in joyfully knowing that all things had been fulfilled through Jesus, who was the completion of the Torah, and that the new commandment that was given to this new community was one of love, to love each other and to love the Lord with all their hearts, souls, and minds. So the application there was for us to, like Paul, retain the sense of uh, authenticity and also the core understanding of who Jesus is as the Messiah, the completer of the requirements of the law, and that we would have as a sign of the new community, actually, not circumcision, but baptism. That becomes the sign of the community, the sign of the new uh, kingdom. So we're looking at Acts 16 now through the end, 28, and actually the second uh, uh, missionary journey of Paul begins just a few verses before 16. In chapter 15, uh, verse 36, we begin this second journey of Paul's. Paul says, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns that we preach the word of the Lord to and see how they're doing. So it's kind of like a, miss a missionary journey of encouragement. Let's go back and, and check ev on everyone and see how they're doing. If you look at some of the, <clears throat> my Bible has these beautiful maps. Almost any Bible you get will have the maps of the journey of Paul either inlaid in Acts or maybe at the end of the Bible. But look for it because it's fascinating. I'm a map guy. I love seeing uh, where exactly he traveled to, where he's from, Tarsus, you know, where he kind of set up base in Damascus and Antioch, and then how he traveled back and forth to Jerusalem. And then from there, he set out and traveled all throughout the Gentile community, ending up in Rome. Right. So um, if you pick it up from uh, chapter 16, you start to see that actually he ends up going this time to Macedonia, which was even farther than he had gone the first journey. And he has this call. It's sometimes referred to as the Macedonian call. He has a, a vision, a dream 
of a man over in Macedonia across the Aegean Sea, okay, saying, come over and help us. We're in need of the proclamation of the good news. Come over to Macedonia and help us. We read chapter 16, verse uh, 9, just before 10. Beautiful image, isn't it? He's open to the Spirit. He hears what the Lord wants him to do, and he responds. It's the important uh, note here is to be open through prayer and fasting, to listen, and then to respond. So Paul goes across the Aegean Sea and lands in uh, what is really present-day uh, Greece or northern Greece, uh, sometimes referred to as Macedonia. Uh, beautiful part of the world, by the way. If you've ever been there, you'll know how uh, turquoise the Aegean Sea is. Uh, up to this point, he's spent his time over in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, also in Damascus and Antioch, present-day Syria, and then, of course, Jerusalem, which is present-day Israel. So he's kept his kind of focus over in this more Middle Eastern region. So when he crosses over the Aegean, he's now entering into the Greco-Roman world, the Western cultural world, and eventually he ends up, of course, we know, in Rome, which is the capital of the empire. And from there, Christianity just you know, blossoms and blooms, especially from the fourth century and on. Right, so, um, yeah, we read about Lydia and her conversion. We read about Paul and Silas, and they're put in prison, and, you know, there's always opposition uh, to the gospel when it's um, proclaimed. Then from chapter 17, he goes down to Thessalonica. Uh, I, I've been privileged in my years of study to go to all of these places, so I really feel... Uh, one with Paul at times when I realize all the difficult geographic terrain that he went through, uh, both mountainous and, uh, you know, the, 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 the roads were not always uh, paved and he had to go across the oceans by boat and was even shipwrecked, and yet all the while he kept the faith. Eventually he ends in Corinth, right, which is the uh, seaport for the whole um, uh, Peloponnesian uh, peninsula of Greece. Uh, Athens, the capital, is not far from there at all. And uh, he proclaims the gospel there, and he's uh, you know, received, and uh, uh, the, the Greco-Roman world uh, converts to Christianity, much of them. Uh, he then decides that it's time after he returns to begin his third missionary journey. I'm just going very quickly. So we're on chapter 18 now, verse 23, and he realized that after spending some time in Antioch, right, he's back home, He's got to go back again and check on everyone. So he goes once more, a third journey, and he ends up going all the way through Asia Minor again, goes to Ephesus, which is that seaport on, uh, just south of actually uh, Istanbul, if you look on a map. And uh, he's shouted down there by the people who have a devotion to one of the uh, Greco-Roman gods, Artemis. Uh, but he holds his ground um, he proclaims the gospel there, probably spends some time in Ephesus, and ends up then, chapter 20, going over to Macedonia and then Greece again. We read about how uh, Eutychus is raised from the dead at Troas. So just as Jesus said, you will do these and even greater works, his disciples did indeed do the same deeds and even greater ones. So we have um, an account of that, a historical record of these things that took place. Eventually, he gets to Jerusalem. Okay, I'm all the way up to chapter 21. You have to just read this on your own and just kind of soak it in. It almost feels like you're reading a travel log when you go through it. He gets to uh, Jerusalem, and he gets put on trial. I mean, who would have thunk it, right? Gets back to the capital city of his own you know, tradition, and he gets apprehended, arrested, put on trial. And then, long story short, he appeals to Rome. In fact, if you want to look, this is a really interesting dialogue that happens here. I always found it interesting because it's in chapter 22 when Paul realizes his life is really on the line. He pulls an ace card, which he had in his back pocket. So at chapter uh, 22, verse 17, we read, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. And so where does he go? He goes out into the Gentile community. Okay. So this is where he really feels his call is to the people outside 
of the fold. So, Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and to beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval, guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. I said last week, we really have a story here of conversion, transformation. Paul goes from being the chief persecutor to the chief apologist, the defender of the faith. That just is quite a remarkable conversion story, isn't it? The very person who had uh, you know, applauded the stoning of Stephen and was himself going from synagogue to synagogue, rooting out the people of the way, as they were called, later called Christians in Antioch. He's persecuting them. He goes from persecuting to defending, being an apologist for it. And he goes to the ends of the earth, as he says it, to the very ends to proclaim the gospel. So as he's there, having gotten apprehended by you know, the crowds and by the Roman uh, guards, he gets flogged. This is verse 24. The commander ordered, this is the Roman commander, ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks, and he directed him to be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were so you know, shouting at him like this. And Paul says, um, by the way, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? That's the question he asks. Now, the centurion, remember, that's someone who's in charge of 100 soldiers, so a pretty important person, called to mind, remember Cornelius, who converted uh, uh, by Peter uh, in Caesarea. But anyway, this centurion hears this, and he immediately becomes afraid, and he says, well, well how come we're doing this? He's a Roman a, a citizen. We can't do this. So the commander went to Paul and said, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And Paul says, yes, I am. So then the commander said, well, I had to buy a big price for my citizenship. And Paul says, but I was born a citizen. You know, in the ancient world, actually, Rome ruled, basically, the world as we knew it. Um, the Mediterranean Sea was basically the known world to those you know, people living there. And uh, you weren't just automatically a Roman citizen. You had to either be born into it or you had to come by it through uh, you know, a hefty price. And so Paul uses his Roman citizenship here uh, to the advantage of the kingdom. He knows that rather than being put to death right there on the spot, it would be to his advantage to appeal to Rome and thus be able to go to Rome and continue the proclamation there. So that's exactly what happens in chapter 23. There's this plot to kill Peter. I'm sorry, Paul. He escapes. 24, he's on trial before Felix, and then another trial in front of Festus. And all of these are confirmation of what the Lord had said to Paul, that you will be my witness, that you will go before kings and magistrates and you will speak just as Jesus had predicted his disciples would, proclaiming the good news to all these different people. So he um, finally gets sent then to Rome because he's appealed to Rome. And along the way, as he's going by both land and then by ship, you remember the account where the storm comes up. This is chapter 27. It's really quite um, exciting reading because it's a, uh, you know, Mediterranean Sea is a dangerous place. I mean, you could have these storms suddenly whip up and he becomes shipwrecked. And he ends up on the shores of Malta, but instead of trying to flee, which he could have done, he actually attends to the needs of the people around him. And those people are so taken with this fact that many of them come to faith as a result. So he's on the island of Malta. Uh, last summer, I was uh, given the opportunity, actually, to do a trip through the uh, Mediterranean. And I spent some time there, the very spot where Paul was shipwrecked. And there is a church now built there called, uh, in honor of uh, Paul's shipwreck on the island of Malta. So eventually, he gets to Rome. Okay, under guard. Eventually, he is tried. And eventually, even though Acts 28 doesn't speak to it, according to our church history accounts and tradition, he is beheaded. 
not crucified. And the reason is, as a Roman citizen, it was against the law to be crucified. So this is why you will see Paul, just in case you want to know if you look at your uh, iconography or any of the uh, sacred uh, uh, images or depictions of Peter and Paul, Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded as a Roman citizen. So you'll often see Peter with a cross in his hand and you'll see Paul with a sword. Right. So there you have it, really. It ends rather abruptly, chapter 28. But it's because, uh, in effect, what this book set apart, uh, uh, out to do has been accomplished, and that is to show how the word of God was proclaimed to the far reaches of the world all the way to the very epicenter of the Roman Empire. Um, what, what I want to do here is to try to bring this all into perspective for you. Uh, I told you the first half of Acts is about Peter. We spent time looking at his ministry, his role, and of course we know this is the very rock, as his name uh, indicates, upon which the church is built, right? Our Lord says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom. It's really uh, 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 a beautiful charge. Well, Paul is the other, as I said, pillar of the church, who gives us a role model, I want to say. Um, he gives us a great gift, uh, not only in what he accomplished through the pen. Um, if, if you look at the New Testament, by the way, here's the whole Bible, but if you look at the you know, New Testament, you have 27 books written. And of those 27 books, right, four Gospels, the Acts, and then all the letters, of those 27 books, guess how many were written by Paul? Almost half. 13 of them by his own hand or dictated. That's amazing. Half the New Testament is a gift of his to this new community, if you will. Beautiful letters, right? Just heartwarming, encouraging, most of them. And so much of our theology, which is reflected in the creeds, actually are centered and rooted on what Paul gives us in these 13 books that, or letters, epistles we call them, that he uh, wrote. But that's not really what I want to focus on. What I want to say to you is his true gift is what he models for us. I mean, Paul is the one who put faith into action. He not only encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, but he listened and then obeyed. And he allowed himself to be converted from a persecutor to a defender of this new way, the community called Christians. Further, he goes and takes this message to the most difficult places on the planet, not afraid to travel by land, by sea, by by, by you know, uh, horseback across difficult terrain. He encountered opposition every single step of the way. People did not like him much. And he was saying something that had not been heard of before. And there was a lot of persecution towards him. He went almost through every imaginable hardship you can think of. He was arrested. He was beaten. If you look at the accounts of this, actually it looks like on five different occasions. He was flogged, which is a serious beating. He was belittled. He was ridiculed, made fun of. He was eventually sent to Rome to be put on trial, and along the way he's shipwrecked. He is eventually beheaded as a defender of the faith. I had the occasion to spend time in the basilica that bears his name, St. Paul outside the walls in Rome recently, where you can see the very chains that Paul wore the last two years of his life before his beheading. It's outside the walls because it was outside the city walls of Rome. You can still go there today and you can actually spend time in prayer there in front of those chains, realizing what Paul was willing to suffer for his faith. This is what I want you to think of when you think of his suffering. What he wrote in Philippians chapter 4. This is the letter that he wrote to the church in Philippi, which is in 
Macedonia, just north of Thessalonica. He, he writes in the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 11, and it'll put all of this into context. Just like I shared with you last week about what he wrote in the letter to the Galatians, right? This is the letter to the Philippians, and he says this, I have learned to be content with whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, that's a profound word of encouragement to us, is it not? And when you think about what he suffered, what he went through, you know, being shipwrecked, being arrested, belittled, ridiculed, beaten, all those things. And he writes this very beloved verse here in 13 I can do all of this because of him. You know, I've learned to be content whether I'm hungry or whether my stomach is full, you know, whether uh, I'm living in plenty or want, uh, whatever my circumstances may be, I can do this because of Christ. We, we as a globe right now are going through a very difficult time. I want to acknowledge that, obviously, with the pandemic. But also the unrest that we see on the streets of our beloved country here in the United States and across the globe. People really frustrated and confused. People who are just in kind of confused, confusion. They're uncertain about school, about their job, about the country, about social conventions, about civil unrest itself, about uh, everything that's been happening on our streets and protest. It's a kind of a scary time, to be honest. And yet, I want for you to take away from this study, first of all, that there's more to life than this. But as we even live this, and with all of its confusion and difficulties, know that Christ is here with us. He has not abandoned us. And we can do all things through him because he strengthens us. And that's why when we look at Paul and we look at the other apostles and all the saints that have gone before us, I take great hope and I find great encouragement when I look at their lives and realize that this is the faith that we as a community here at Mary Help of Christians share with them. We are in a long line of apostles that continue on even to this day. So listen to his voice and obey. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.